Welcome back to the Houndsman XP podcast. This is Chris coming at you from the uh, Houndsman XP base camp in Bear Branch, Indiana. And Steve is in Florida with his Salt Life Straw Brim hat on, rubbing suntan lotion on himself. Wow. He, Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Chris. Uh, I really am. Uh, I don't know what you've got for weather up there. I, uh, I checked, and today we're going to have 86 and sun. That is too so, hot. Uh, yeah, really. You probably don't uh, get any humidity with that at all, do you? <laughs> well, I, I often liken it down here to when you open the door and step out. It's like sticking your head in the oven to check on the pizza. Yes. You know, that's kind of the effect that we get down here. But uh, it's where the old elephants come to die. Chris, and uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I, I guess that tells you all you need to know about my my station in life. My friend the other day told me, he said, Steve, you know, we're standing in the checkout line, <laughs> and I said, boy, that's a sobering thought, but no, things are great in Florida, Chris. Great, really, great. Really good. Well, hey, we are, uh, we have, of course, every show we do is awesome, but uh uh, we try to bring very good content to this podcast and things that are relevant. And it's our pleasure today to have uh, Dr. Alan Halada on the line with us. And uh, he goes by Doc Holiday on the UKC forums. And I've watched him over the years give sound advice or weigh in on some health issue topics without violating his professional ethics and he was very um he was very enthusiastic about coming on and and uh, being involved in in just uh getting down to some of the basics on some of this health stuff so i'm sure doc you're going to talk over over my head but you know one last thing before i turn it over to you i kind of i kind of watch these message forums and probably the only thing that comes close to uh uh, some of the misinformation about veterinary care, health, and our hounds is is when people start giving legal devi- legal advice about how to deal with the game warden. So, um, <laughs> I know I know when I see stuff like that, I kind of sit back and cringe and think, no, no, no. And I know you've probably uh, experienced some of the same stuff. So today we're going to get to the bottom of that. But Doc, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, you guys, and thank you so much for inviting me on this show. I really appreciate it, and it's a great honor. Well, Doc, uh, Doc I have uh, – Go ahead. Chris, I'm going to jump in here. Do it. And that's going to be the last time I interrupt you this morning. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I, I just wanted to tell Doc that uh, I have a special, uh, I guess, place in my heart for veterinarians because when I was in the Air Force during the Vietnam War era, although I was not in Vietnam, I was in northern Japan, uh, the war ended and there was a lot of GIs out there uh, across the the world, actually, that uh, their uh, serious uh, skills were not needed any longer because the war was over. And so they had a a program called Project Transition, and that simply meant if you were going to transition into a civilian job, for instance, if you were going to be a truck driver, they would send you to the base motor pool and let you work that last six months. In my case, I told them I wanted to be a veterinarian, and they let me go down to the base uh, vet, uh, uh, vet uh, clinic They operated uh, a veterinary clinic on base. There were about 2,000 GIs and their families there, and they all had pets. And we ran a clinic, and we did surgery one day a week and on. So I got to work uh, on the inside there for six months and really uh, gained a lot of uh, appreciation and respect for what veterinarians do. So I just wanted to tell you that I'm really excited about having you on the podcast. Oh, well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. And, you know, when I when I first started practicing or before I started practicing, actually, uh, most of the veterinarians in the southwest Wisconsin area where I was at uh, were graduates of Minnesota, Iowa. And, and and everyone that I met had served in, you know, 
some war um, or had done some military uh, work, and they, that was their background. And then they had had their uh, veterinary school paid for by uh, the government, basically, for their service work. So it's really cool that you brought that up. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll just kind of go back to that whole Air Force thing. In the Marine Corps, uh, we were kind of given the same options to do some of that stuff, but that's the difference between the Air Force and the Marine Corps. If we just said we wanted to work with animals, they would have sent us to the chow hall. So, <laughs> yeah, there wasn't there wasn't going to be any veterinary clinics for me. So, Doc, I just want to talk <laughs> – I want to touch a little bit on uh, – on your education and your background, I just want to give you some time to to uh, introduce yourself to our listeners and uh, let people know who Doc Holliday is. Okay, that sounds good, Chris. Well, I, I grew up in the southwest corner of Wisconsin and a little town um, named Ridgeway, and I eventually uh, moved to Dodgeville and lived in the country, grew up in the country, uh, worked on a dairy farm there for about eight years. And while I was working on the dairy farm, um, uh, we lived in the country there, I ordered my first red bone coon hound out of the back of a full cry magazine ad, one of those little classified ads, and uh, she came out of Missouri, and they uh, shipped her up sight unseen, and uh, I remember driving to the airport with my sister to pick her up, and um, she came in this fancy German-made uh, dog crate, it was all handmade and everything, it was really good, good quality care, and she was in perfect shape and everything, and I... I just got really lucky, and I ended up with a really good dog. And, and working on the dairy farm, one of the daughters there uh, had married a coon hunter, and uh, I, he was a pretty, pretty big name. And I found out later that their family had been in competition coon hunting for quite a few years, and um, his name was John Adamitz. And so John uh, became one of my mentors and trainers, and uh, I, I would travel uh, every night almost to his house about 30 miles away, um, used my dad's parts truck. I was like 15 years old, so I didn't even have a driver's license at the time. But I was so <laughs> so into coon hunting and so into competition hunting at that point that um, yeah, I just uh, I would do anything to go coon hunting with him. And I, he, I was really lucky because uh, I started off with one of the better dogs in in the country at that time, and that was back when Dave Dean was uh, hitting it pretty big with his hammer dogs. And uh, a lot of the dogs in that area uh was predominantly uh blue ticks from his breeding in the ocean line too mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um yeah john's dogs were um all hammer two bred dogs and and man i'll tell you what even going back to today looking at those dogs what they were especially that dog uh, that he had named bruiser uh, he's still one of the classiest dogs i've ever hunted with and he just became a big um you know, kind of a yardstick for me going forward, what, what kind of dog I wanted and stuff like that. So that made a huge difference in uh, how fast uh, I got to success with my own dogs. Uh, and then I um, decided at that point, uh, not too long after that, that I didn't want to become a dairy farmer because that was a really rough living and <laughs> long hours. And um, I decided to go into uh, veterinary medicine. That was kind of a dream of mine ever since I was 14 years old anyways. And so I pursued veterinary medicine and I went to undergrad at UW Wisconsin River Falls, a little small school outside uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, in, on the Wisconsin side, I should say. And uh, it was a really known for its dairy program there and pre-vet program. And I just remember showing up there. There was 400, uh, 400 of us students that showed up for the first day uh, for pre-veterinary uh, talk. And the, wow. and the instructor just looked at us and he goes, <clears throat> he goes, just take a look around this room right now. And he says... Um, there's only going to be about five to seven of you that get into the veterinary program. And I'm just thinking, Oh my God, really? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, um, so, and it was true because after our third year, uh, me and one of my best friends, Jay, uh, ended up getting into veterinary school in Madison after three years of undergrad. So we got in early and then the rest of my classmates, uh, there was five more taken the next year. So there was seven out of our class that made it into, um, the veterinary school. It's really competitive. Uh, he was right on the mark was, then. I'm sure it's more today. Yeah, he was. He was really accurate. Yeah. And so then yeah, I did my undergrad uh, work in, at UW River Falls, Wisconsin. And then I <clears throat> transferred to uh, Madison for my postgrad work and did veterinary school there. It was a brand new school at the time, which was really cool because we had a kind of an East and West Coast influence. They mm-hmm. had a lot of instructors from University of Cornell. And then they had a lot of uh, instructors from uh, UC Davis. So that was a big clash, actually, when you look at um, the mentality and the, the thoughts, the theories and stuff that come out of those two schools, uh, real big clash of egos and, and theories and stuff. So it was really good to see both sides 
uh, of the equation there when you're going to school at that time. Uh, and we had really high quality instructors. We were really lucky at that time to when they first started that program. Um, they had and really practical uh, people coming in there too. So a lot of people with, um, I remember like Lee Allenstein was like the god when it came to dairy uh, production medicine and, and cows. And he was actually one of our instructors. We were mm-hmm. just like wowed that he was actually there at the school, you know. And so that, it was just a really big deal for me um, being able to get through that program. And and it was tough, you know. When, in undergrad, you are I was the top of my class. I was the, you know, the top one or two students in the class mm-hmm. all the time in grades. And then when I got into veterinary school, I thought I could just kind of, you know, coast through. I was really smart. And um, I remember my first exam, me and Jay were out partying and having a good time. And we were like, oh, we just go home and jam for this next test. And I think we both ended up with D's on that test. And the average in the class was a C. So that my, my biochem instructor was like, you guys are really going to wake up here, you know? And yeah. <laughs> we had to buckle down. Yeah. A little humility. That one. <laughs> yeah. And, and the instructor was really cool because he was actually a Nobel Peace Prize winner for his research in, um, in heart medicine and humans. And he, he gave us a second chance. The entire class got to retake that biochem test, but man, that was the last time we went out partying like that. <laughs> got, got our bootstraps buckled up. That's for sure. And got to work. But yeah, I graduated in 1990 uh, from University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, started a practice um, up in Minnesota, in the, on the right on the border, actually on the Mississippi River, a uh, little city called Winona, Minnesota, and just a gorgeous area. I was really lucky to start out in that that kind of an area. And <clears throat> the cool thing about Winona was that um, you had a real good broad uh, base there of people that, um, there's a lot of industry there, you know, fast, uh, fast small is one of the big uh, success stories in that area. Yeah. And then you also had, um, a lot of people that were into hunting there. So a lot of bird, bird dog hunters, a lot of people with labs and bird dogs. And that was probably about 40% of our clientele was, um, was hunting dogs, which I really loved. And cause I was really big into coon hunting at that time. But, uh, going back to my veterinary school, I want to tell you one thing. Um, I, I ended up buying a, a red bone coon hound when I was a junior in veterinary school. And I spent every bit of my money I ever had in my accounts for this dog and had to make two payments on him to, to get him. But I always, I really wanted him bad because he was a, one of the best uh, red bones I ever hunted with. And he really exemplified what I was looking for in a, in a stud dog or a, even a competition dog uh, based on what I had hunted with in the past with that bruiser dog I was telling you about as my yardstick. And so anyways, <clears throat> I got this dog and I had, um, the previous owner was helping me uh, handle him while I was in veterinary school. And, and we, uh, we did a lot of big time winning. And he ended up um, uh, at the world hunt and being that Pac-Man dog, uh, which was a big deal for us. And uh, I remember John Miller coming up to me and telling me, you know, that, that my dog was his favorite going into the finals and stuff like that. But we had an unlucky thing happen at the finals. We got, we got kind of split up in our cast and dogs got lost in a windy night. We couldn't find him, and he got scratched for not being able to get the dog back in an hour. But he ended up going on to be one of the top stud dogs in the breed. Uh, yeah, Don's Timberjack. And um, what? Well, say his name again. I, I say his name so again, good. again, Alan. Oh, Don Timberjack. Okay. Yeah, and your and your story is so yeah. similar to some a lot of other houndsmen we've we've spoken with, and we've known, and maybe yeah. even uh, myself uh, as far as you know, spending the grocery money on coon dog stuff or on these hounds. So, uh, (laughs) one of the first dogs that I ever got, um, that was, was an outstanding hound. I did the same thing. I, I, I took a small loan out to purchase the hound. And I think it's just a sickness that we have or the dedication to the hounds. (laughs) It's crazy. Yeah, it really is. You know, once you get into it, I knew exactly what I wanted, you know, and I've, pretty much been a perfectionist most of my life i really wanted that top-notch dog and i'd hunted with some of the best dogs in the you know in the breed at that time and i remember being at autumn oaks and i was handling a blue tick for a buddy of mine and uh she was actually leading the cast and there was like probably 20 30 minutes left in the hunt and there's a dog named uh, smoky mountain brandy that elger morgan was handling at the time and and elger and i were pretty decent friends we didn't know each other great but we were decent friends and um knew of each other and stuff and that was my first time to really get to hunt with a really top-notch um, red bone outside what I had. And, um, well, we got into those, those bean fields, you know, on that time of year out there. I think it was in Ohio or Indiana. I think it was Indiana. And um, and that blue chick got her nose down in that bean field and couldn't get out of there. And Brandy got hooked on the side of on a fence, and, and Elders looked at me and kind of nudged me. And, 
I was like, man, you son of a gun. I could tell that dog had a coon. You know, we walked over there and scored it, and that uh, was the end of the hunt. I was yeah. like, man, I got to get me a piece. I got to get me a piece of that breeding. And he was, <laughs> he was Kaufman bred dog, which is basically timber chopper. And uh, that's what I was looking for. And so this dog that I had, Timberjack, he was, um, he had timber chopper five times in a four generation pedigree. So he was really heavy bred timber chopper. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, he went on to become a big stud dog and, at one time, him and Fireball were the top two studs in the breed, and um, uh, he was actually in the top. He was the top five of all breeds for a little while, which is pretty cool when they first yeah. started that performance program. Well, Doc, yeah. where, it where, was really cool to have you a part of that. Where are you now? What's what's your status status now? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I got a little tired of the the cold winters back there in, in uh, the Midwest, and I decided to move west, and uh, ended up in Idaho for seven years, and then. Um, moved from there to California and I opened my practice out here in, uh, 2003. And, you know, when I first got out here, a lot of people were like, well, they think of California is the anti-hunting state, which it, it really is in government. They definitely are against hunting. You can see the laws that are coming out and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But if you look at the state and the people that are here, it, it's a totally different story because land mass wise we're mostly conservative uh, a very red state as far as land mass goes mm-hmm. uh, with two large cities influencing our vote which is you know los angeles and san francisco and then a little right. bit of sacramento but um yeah land mass wise this is a very conservative state still and very i was surprised when i got out here the number of people that are actually into hunting and uh, they do have coon hounds they have bird dogs um, pig dogs hog dogs you know and a lot of people are into cat hunting yet that get, um, you know, permits and stuff for that. So that's kind of cool to see that when I got out here. And I do have quite a few clients that have coon hounds too here. So I get to work with, um, you know, red bones, blue ticks mostly uh, in this area. So, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. And, um, yeah. Well, well, Doc, back in the day, you mentioned a lot of dogs that I remember from my UKC days for sure. And I think as we were talking earlier, that's where you and I met uh, for the first time uh, as through those Coonhound events and the world hunts and so forth. Um, The reason, of course, uh, and it's great uh, to have a a veterinarian that understands hound people and our our, uh, particular needs. I know a dog is a dog uh, as far as the anatomy is concerned, but you mentioned California and back in my UKC days, I recall um, talking to several houndsmen out there that had to deal with foxtails and and how devastating uh, those could be to, uh, to a hound. Uh, Just uh, give us a little brief capsule about what they are and how that affects hounds out there. Yeah. I never really noticed. I never found a foxtail on a dog until I moved to Idaho and, when I was doing some relief work out of the Boise area, um, we would have like between eight and 15 dogs a day that came in for foxtail removals. Um, basically, it was so heavy of a demand that we would just put these dogs in the back in a kennel and then get to them when we could get to them because we were so busy up there. Um, when I got down to California here, we still had the same issues, but not quite as, uh, as um, to the degree that it was in Idaho, but it's still... Like today, I'll see uh, probably two or three dogs that uh, have foxtails in their feet, in their ears, uh, in their nose, eyes. Um, just removed one from a cat the other day that had it hooked up in the upper eyelid and was causing a corneal um, ulcer, like an abrasion from rubbing on the cornea. And just, oh my God, they're just awful to look at when you see that infection that it causes. But basically, it's a, um, it's like it's shed from uh, the um, grass that we have out here, brown grass, and um, they have these little barbs on them and they just travel and migrate in one direction. And they can actually start in the foot and they can migrate all the way to the heart or the lungs and cause, um, you know, it's pretty significant damage. So right now today, I would say uh, it's probably, you know, 20 to 30% of my business is fleas and foxtails. <laughs> wow. I didn't realize it was still such a problem out there. Um, but uh yeah, well, you know, uh, again, getting back to to this um, uh, thought of having a vet that understands the houndsman, uh, can you just um, uh, briefly address that? How uh, you, you know, I know that we dog people often, especially hound people, often rely on home remedies and old wives' tales. 
to treat our dogs. Uh, and I think the main reason we do that is we think we're saving money. Um, and I, I'm sure in some cases we are. And uh, I often hear people ask, uh, you know, or, or, or uh, uh, muse, I guess you would be the correct word, about having a good old country vet, somebody that understands, uh, you know, my special needs as a hound person. I feed more than one dog. Uh, you know, my dog food bill uh, uh, alone is, is a big slice out of my budget. Uh, what can you know? What can you, as, as a hound hunting veterinarian, uh, say about that, Doc? Yeah, one of the things that surprised me the most when I got into uh, coon hunting was seeing that you know everybody had these dogs that were worth twenty, thirty thousand dollars, but they were being fed like a one dollar, you know, a bag dog food. I never, I never quite understood that. And you know, even the dog boxes, these old dog boxes that were falling apart in the back of their trucks and uh, the dogs were tied up on chains outside little three four foot chains and stuff I, I could never understand that to you how you could have a dog that's worth so much money everybody had a world champion you know in their backyard but um, didn't want to really take care of them you know the way they should be taken care of so I, I didn't really understand the full uh, wellness program on dogs until I went through the University of Wisconsin veterinary program and they, they really emphasize you know uh, nutritional uh, medicine back there and vaccination, the importance of vaccination and the importance of deworming, especially deworming. Uh, parasites are such a big part in the Midwest when it comes to um, keeping a dog healthy and in the cats too. Any, any animal back there, you have so much parasites in the Midwest, not way more than we have out here. Hmm. And, um, you know, you've got heartworm disease back there. You've got roundworm, hookworm, whipworm, tapeworm. You've got the whole gamut back there in the Midwest. It's amazing hmm. how many parasites we deal with back there. And it affects the dogs so much. I mean, it really affects their, from the time they're born right up to the time they die. Um, so it really uh, was a big eye opening to me when we started into these wellness programs at the school and learning how to prevent them. And uh, that the fact that puppies, most puppies in the Midwest are born with roundworms. If, if the mother has not been on a, a really good preventative um, program as far as deworming goes, like ivermectin or uh, heart guard type products. Um, or milbomycin, which is interceptor. Um, if those dogs have not been on, a, those females have not been on a road regimen program like that, um, most of those puppies in the Midwest are born. They get them from their mother. They're transmitted from the placenta to the puppies. And that was really a big opener, why I opened to me that, that I didn't know that before veterinary school, that those puppies are actually born, you know, with roundworms. And it affects their upbringing their, and the growth of those puppies. And and then how aggressive the worming schedule needs to be. When I got into practice in Winona, Minnesota, um, I brought in a lot of those, uh, you know, techniques that I learned in school. And at that time, they were doing like maybe once a month they would get a wormer as a puppy. Uh, but we were, we learned in school that, you know, almost every two weeks those puppies need to be dewormed with a really good uh, Pyrantel pan weight, for example, which is strongid uh, in, the, in the equine field <clears throat> uh, or – you know, something like Safeguard, which we're using a lot now, which is a Benbendazole type product. Uh, and we, what I would do back there is I would actually alternate those wormers every two weeks. So the first time that puppy came in at six to eight weeks, you know, we gave them a parvo <clears throat> vaccination and they got their first deworming program uh, going, which was usually like Strongid or Pyrantel mm -hmm. uh, the first time. And then the second time, you know, in, in two weeks, we'd send home like uh, the Febentel or back then it was called Rintol. But now it's Safeguard, which is Fenbendazole, which is a similar type product. Uh, so we would alternate those wormers because a lot of the parasites do develop resistance patterns. And especially with PAM, one of the uh, Strongid products, we saw a lot of resistance, uh, roundworm resistance to those. So we would deworm for, you know, two, three times with, um, with Strongid. And those, dog, those puppies would still come back in positive for roundworms. But now what's really cool is that we're seeing is um, the new test methods are changing. So instead of doing microscopic examination of these parasites, trying to find these eggs that are being shed in the stool, you know, in the, in the feces of these dogs, we actually send in for DNA analysis now, which is really cool because they can find the needle in the haystack now. We don't, we're not missing any parasites. So if they've got any kind of those, any of those parasites, roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, uh, tapeworms, they're going to find those on the DNA analysis, including Giardia. So uh, that was a big one there, that the whole parasite prevention part was really big for me. And 
what I saw out there was that people weren't deworming. You know, a lot of my friends that had coon hounds weren't deworming. And those puppies had those big, you know, pot bellied appearance and skinny in the chest. And, you know, yeah. I, and I started, I started teaching them. I started, you know, guys really need to be deworming these puppies, you know, and a lot of my friends didn't go to veterinarians. They didn't um, utilize veterinarians for their services. They did a lot of the stuff on their own to save money. So that was a big one, um, being able to go out and just teach people proper parasite prevention. Well, I've, and, cert- um, I've certainly actually- been there myself too, Doc. You know, I, I remember when I started, yeah. um, you know, you've got a mentor and, and you have a health problem and you go to them and, you know, well, give him, you know, give him three cc's of kerosene and, and a half a cc of battery acid and that'll get rid of it. So. <sighs> Well, and then flush it down with a little bleach, too. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh. And the other thing is that I see really uh, a lot of in the, in the hound field, anyways, is vaccination issues. And, you know, people have gone the other route now or, or the anti-vax people. Um, but when it comes to dogs, when it comes to especially parvo prevention, that's a big one. That's been around for years, at least the 80, early 80s, you know. Uh, different parts of the country have different uh, strains of parvovirus. Uh, some have more than one strain, and some are really bad. Some are like these puppies get parvo; they don't have a chance. Right. And then the <clears throat> places out here in California, we have puppies that have parvovirus, and um, most of them survive. At least 60, 70 percent of these puppies survive, and with treatment, probably close to 100 hmm. percent. Um, and the treatments really change too, because based on how bad the the puppies are, what their health status. Some of these puppies can be actually be treated at home now, but I want to just go back to the vaccinations on that. It, a lot of my friends didn't even vaccinate for parvovirus, and, and they would lose puppies, you know. Yeah. And, um, it, and today when I go and I look at the message boards, people are still a little confused about what they should be doing when it comes to parvo vaccines. But this is straight from, you know, World Congress proceedings and, and straight from the vaccine companies <clears throat> that make these vaccines, and that is that, we need to vaccinate these puppies starting at, at six to eight weeks of age, right right off the bat. As soon as they're weaned off their mom, you got to start those parvo vaccines. The first one is not protective. The first one is basically uh, neutralizing any antibodies that mother gave to those puppies. So hmm. people think, oh, I did, he got his parvo vaccine. No, he got a parvo vaccine that neutralized the mother's antibodies. And now that puppy is actually more prone to parvo virus. So you neutralize any antibodies that are already in there protecting that uh, that puppy now you got to wait for that next vaccine to, to start building up the immunity to parvovirus. And they need at least four parvo vaccine uh, vaccinations, depending on the area you're in. Uh, and that puppy needs to be at least 16 weeks of age. I would say for most hounds, 16 weeks would be a safe place. Um, so three to four parvo vaccines every three weeks until they're 16 weeks of age. And that is really seems to be a key for preventing parvovirus in these, um, these puppies today. So, and then, uh, you know, if after that, we usually do a booster at one year of age with a Parvo vaccine, and then every three years. That's my schedule is every three years on Parvo, but usually yeah. when they get to be over a year of age, it's really controversial. If, you, if it's a show dog or a dog that's on the road, a lot of competition dog, definitely, you know, vaccinating at least every three years just to be safe. Right. Have you got any uh, <laughs> remedies for, for Steve? It sounds like he's choking to death down there in Florida, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, the, another thing I see commonly on the message board are dogs that have uh, hoarse voices, and uh, there's some great home remedies for that. You know, just using the honey uh, in a little bit of water uh, yeah. really helps to calm yeah. the throat down. You know, and then um, we've, always, we've used doxycycline and prednisone in those dogs, and it works mm-hmm. great. That's probably one of the most common questions we get on the message board is, what do I do if my dog has got a hoarse voice? Yeah. You know, other than getting that dog to stop barking on the chain or barking the kennel, right. which is important, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, honey works great. It really calms the throat down, and it's a great anti-inflammatory. Well, Doc, um, you know, since since uh, Steve sounds like he's got a tick in his throat, let's uh, segue <laughs> into some of the hot topics that, that uh, seem to be uh, – I mean, they're just dominating social media and the message boards. Message boards are kind of taking a hit right now. It's so easy to get information out on on social media, and and social media is a great thing if it's used properly. But uh, there's also a lot of lot of uh, mis misinformation that's floating around out there, and and I'm going to be very uneducated on this. And but what about tick borne diseases? Yeah, that that is a hot subject right now. When I, <clears throat> I actually asked to put out a little 
uh, message to a couple of my friends that are in the competition coon hunting and I asked them what, what's the two hot topics right now that you guys like to hear about and they, they just like you Chris they said thyroid disease and tick-borne disease mm-hmm. and the tick-borne disease the reason being is that um, we're just seeing this incredible surge of ehrlichiosis in these dogs in the Midwest uh, I've never seen so much ehrlichiosis when I was in veterinary school if we had one dog that came in in four years that would be big for ehrlichiosis you know it wasn't real big in Wisconsin at that time. Um, but, man, I'll tell you, just in the last two to three years since I have got back into coon hunting and uh, the competition part, um, I'm just surprised how much ehrlichiosis there is in the Midwest. And it's not just the Midwest. It starts all the way down to Texas and goes all the way up through, you know, Maine. And, it, and a lot of it is the surge of the Lone Star Tick. We're seeing a huge rise in Lone right. Star Tick that's being able to transmit this disease. Uh, and that, that starts from Texas and it goes all the way up through Tennessee, all the way up through, you know, New York and, and in the main. So if you look at that whole pattern of the Lone Star Tick, it's not just Texas. Everybody thinks Lone Star Tick's just down south, but it's not. It's definitely, uh, it covers that whole area. So, I, and unfortunately, that's where most of your competition coon hunts are, is in that Midwest area <clears throat> back there. And, um, and that's where most of my dogs are right now. Mm-hmm. So I definitely uh, know first-hand knowledge of what it's like to deal with dogs with um, with ehrlichiosis. So let's just talk about that first, and then we'll get yeah. into Lyme disease, which is a, uh, another concern definitely out there. But I'd say ehrlichiosis right now is, is at least 70% of the tick-borne disease that um, I'm getting questions on. And I think the biggest problem we're dealing with right now is that people just aren't listening or they're not um, doing a good job of preventing ticks from attaching and, and there's a lot of controversy around how long does it take for that tick, you know, to burrow into the dog, bite the dog, and then to transmit that disease to the dog. And, and it really depends on the source you're looking at. But old, old theories were definitely it took, you know, 24 to 48 hours for Lyme disease, uh, which we still are adhering to at least 24 hours for Lyme disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in lich- lichiosis, it's, we really don't know. And I don't know if there's anybody out there that has that exact answer, but if you look at a lot of the studies that have been done, um, tw- up to 12 to 24 hours. Uh, 12 hours is the minimum I've seen. So now that pre- presents a quite a problem because a lot of the tick uh, products we've had on the market, it takes up to you know 12 to 24 hours for them to kill a tick. Mm-hmm. And so people have this image in their th- their mind that if we apply one product to a dog, it's going to be 100% protective for that dog. And I think if there's one thing I want to get across for tick-borne disease, that is don't rely on one product to prevent tick-borne disease in your dog uh definitely use a topical product as a repellent Mm -hmm. so you've got you know your permethrin sprays out there some really good quality sprays on the market you you can buy the the concentrated stuff and glue it down or you can buy one that's already made for spraying on dogs you know the dog hate the spray spray it on a rag and rub rub it on that way but make sure you're covering you know the neck and the chest the, the abdomen and then along the back and the legs and I usually recommend doing that before they cut those dogs loose each time. So you're getting a good repellency, a good concentration out there in the woods. Um, and then there's a whole new class of, of systemic. And systemic, what I mean by that is it's a drug that actually is given orally. There's a new class of drug now that is just sweeping our profession. It's the hot thing for fleas and ticks. And the reason it's so good is because this, this stuff actually has the ability to kill ticks within eight hours. Uh, which is the fastest we've ever had to deal with. And, you know, we're really lucky to have these products. And um, there's four of them on the market. So you've got NextGuard, which is a monthly product. That was the first to market. And then it was followed by Brevecto, which is a three-month product. You give one pill and it lasts three months. Uh, and then Saperica came on the market like a year after that. Uh, that's a Zoetis product. And that actually has been my favorite go-to product. And I'll explain why that is. And then the third, the fourth one now is Credelio. Uh, which is an Alonco type product. Well, I, uh, I can Alonco jump product. in there real quick, Doc. You know, yeah. uh, because I, this is interesting to me. You know, I'm using a top of the line name brand topical uh, for for tick prevention, tick and flea and tick prevention, but it's been less than the the recommended dosage, and I'm picking five ticks off of a dog the other day. You know, and so this is very interesting, and I think we get in this habit of thinking, you know, what do I do? How do I? What's the answer here? And I think you summed it up real well. We've got a, we've got a. When it's something as serious as Erlichia, then 
these people are seeing definite uh, drop in performance from these dogs that are diagnosed with that. I've battled with a Lyme disease and mild ehrlichia here too, and uh, it really does affect these dogs. and And we're expecting a lot out of them. So I really appreciate you touching on that. Oh yeah, it, you know, I think that we've underplayed the effects of tick-borne disease on our dogs and on their performance and their health, their overall health and longevity. And now we know for sure that these tick-borne diseases can lead to way more serious conditions like, um, you know, kidney disease that can wipe a dog out completely. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a small percentage of those dogs that, that it actually affects the kidneys, but it definitely can. It can affect, um, you know, most of your organs in your body. But getting back to the preventative part, um, you know, you look back in the 1980s when I first started um, running dogs, and we were using sprays, which actually right. is still pretty effective. Um, permethrin sprays were on the market back then, too. But the big mm-hmm. problem we had with permethrin was that it's, it's, it, at higher concentrations, it's very toxic. Right. And the FDA continues to issue warnings to, you know, to consumers and veterinarians that, you know, be careful with these products. Um, because they are very toxic to dogs. And what we would see is these permethrin collars, uh, these dogs are coming in, they're seizuring, uh, and you still see it with the, the collars today, the, the flea and tick collars are still very toxic if they get them off and they chew on them, mm-hmm. or even at higher concentrations. If somebody puts a big dog collar on a small dog, um, we see these, um, these seizures in these smaller dogs, these neurologic problems. What about, what so about cattle tags, Doc? You stole my yeah. question, Chris. <laughs> oh, man, I'm so glad you brought that up. I, you know, I was going on the message board this morning. I was looking at what's, what's the current stuff the last couple of days, and some guy was wanting to put cattle, do, uh, cattle tag dogs on, or cattle tags on his uh, boots for himself. And I never heard anything like that. And then some other guy says, well, yeah, I, I, um, I heard a story about a guy that did that. He came down sick, was in the hospital came back out, put the tags back on his boots, ended up back in the hospital, you know. Right. Well, when we deployed about before when we deployed to Desert yeah. Storm, uh there were there were people over there deployed over there that were using uh uh hearts flea and tick collars to prevent sand fleas and the commanding command staff put out a, a memorandum about do not do this, you know, cuz it's so I, I, I can relate there. I didn't do it. Luckily, um, you know, somebody else got sick before I got the bright idea to try to pull that stunt. Yeah. Well, Doc, uh, yeah. let me let me jump in here real quick. I'm in Florida. Yeah. Uh, flea heaven. You know, yeah. I mean, we manufacture fleas down here. Um, yeah. And uh, the dogs get out and roll in the grass. They pick them up from the sand or whatever. And uh, the biggest thing people are using down here are these expensive flea collars that you buy at the farm store that cost Mm -hmm. $60 or whatever for eight months. So uh, are the ingredients in those collars you're saying are harmful? Well, I wouldn't say that they're – we don't know the long-term effects on some of those. If they've got studies for long-term studies on that stuff, um, I'm not aware of it. It's not a true permethrin product, but it's a permethrin analog they're using in those collars, uh, along with Advantage. Um, so it's basically mm-hmm. like Advantix, ticks, but it's um, got your permethrin in there and your Advantage. It's got, I shouldn't say it's got permethrin, it's got a permethrin analog in there. Um, if you look at some of the, the effects of permethrin long-term in dogs, there, there's still no exact science to or studies done that show hormonal effects long-term. But we know that permethrin is a definitely a hormonal influencer. It definitely has effects on hormones in the body. So they even talk about, you know, if it's on human skin, uh, be careful because, you know, on pregnant women, for example, um, those hormonal changes can, can possibly be detrimental. So in dogs, uh, you know, you got to weigh the, the advantages versus the side effects. And uh, certainly I would rather take my risk with a hormonal imbalance, you know, if it's going to happen versus a tick-borne disease, I guess that's the, hmm. you know, what's the worst here between the two, but if you use them responsibly, and that's what I want to get back, back to is that, you know, cow tags are made for cows and they're a higher concentrated product, obviously, because they're covering a huge surface area on a cow right. versus a dog. Uh, there's, there's no long-term studies on cow tags and dogs. And if there was, I, I don't know of any. So if anybody finds one, let me know. 
so there's really no safety studies. You don't know what the long-term safety is on those tags. Sure, they may keep the ticks off the dog, but what's the effects on the dog long-term, you know, sure. internally? Because those uh, people say, well, it's external. You're not giving it internally. Well, the dogs are licking themselves. So those tags are spreading that chemical chemical across the body, and then the dogs are licking themselves. They're, they're definitely um, internalizing it also. Hmm. So, yeah, Stephen, your situation, the best thing going for fleas right now are those that new class of flea products, flea and tick products, and that would be your Next Guard, your Brevecto, your Semperica, your uh, Credelio. And I can't recommend one over the other for fleas. They're all amazing for fleas. When it comes to tick control, though, the Semperica hands down. Uh, the reason Semperica has the advantage over those other products is we know in, in studies now that it actually has um, almost twice the killing speed uh, when it comes to ticks. So it like, actually kills ticks within eight hours. Um, with Next Guard, it can take up to 12 to 24 hours for it to kill ticks still. Doc, uh, with Doc, Renato, it's still, oh, Doc could, you, uh, could you repeat the name of that for ticks again? It, uh, I'm not sure if we got a technical glitch there, but I kind of, I, I missed oh, okay. that. Okay. Yeah, so the, the one that I uh, have been using uh, on my own dogs and one I've been recommending is called Simperica. Okay. S I M P A R I C A, Simperica. Is that yeah, an oral a medication device. or a topical? Top? That's an oral tablet. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, and I'll tell you how fast this stuff is. When we first got Next Guard in, we would give these dogs that had lots of fleas on their body right in the exam room. We would give them a, a Next Guard tablet at the beginning of the exam. And by the end of the exam, when we were done, ten, five to ten minutes later, the fleas were already starting to fall off the dog. So this new class of, of flea and tick product is tremendous. It's, it's the best we've ever had. Hmm. Is it once a um, month uh, application? Yeah. So Next Guard, Semperica, and Credelio are once a month. And then Brevecto is every three months. Are these available, um, uh, you know, uh, in over the counter, or are they strictly by prescription? Yeah, these are FDA controlled products. They're actually a drug, so they do require a prescription. Okay. And I do know that um, there are places that people have been buying them. Uh, the only thing I would caution on that is that we've been down that road before with Frontline and Advantage, where you buy a product from Australia, for example, and have it shipped in. And then we come to find out that a lot of those were counterfeit products. So you got to right. be a little careful there, too. Our products actually come direct from the manufacturer, most of those products. Uh, some come through our distributor, but a lot of those come direct from the manufacturer itself to avoid that kind of stuff. So old guys like me shouldn't buy little blue pills that are made outside the United States. Is that the kind of thing we're talking about? <laughs> uh, credit, yeah, I, could, yeah, I had to go it. there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> how do you say, how do you I'm, say I'm sorry in Japanese, you, Steve? Go yeah. a sigh. I told you I'd be saying that a lot on this program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so getting back to uh, repellency then. So you've got a product now that's a systemic product that's super fast at killing ticks. Is it 100%? No way. Those products are not 100% in preventing tick-borne illness, and we know that, but they're really good. Um, I would say I've had, probably had one or two uh, that I know of that were on these products that developed ehrlichiosis. Now, that could have happened now. Ehrlichiosis could have been in their system before they started this product, but they were – diagnosed with ehrlichiosis after starting these products. So they're definitely great. I'll tell you that I've had um, a couple of dogs in the same kennel, and we've had one on one of the products called Next Guard, the other one on Semperica. And this, the handler would call me and say, hey, you know, Doc, um, I think we need to put them all on Semperica. I said, what's going on? He says, well, the dogs that are on Next Guard, we're seeing the dead, t dead ticks on. And the Semperica dogs, I've yet to find a tick on those dogs. And that's when hmm. we started, the wheels started turning, thinking that probably there's a faster kill in the, in the Semperica product. And then research came out two years later and supported that, that, yeah, there's definitely a, a difference there. But I still think that we need to use a repellency on the outside along with that. And those sprays are so cheap. And, and to have one in your truck and just use it on a rag, spray your dog down before you cut them loose, you know, that's a great way of repelling, you know, mosquitoes and, and ticks and fleas all at once. Wow. Yeah, so, good idea. Yeah. Well, Doc, so that's great with the combination. Yeah, excuse me, Doc. The spray you would recommend is what? Well, I would say a, a good permethrin spray because permethrin has some of your best repellency for ticks, and um, it's going to last a little bit longer too. 
And a lot of people will buy the concentrated stuff and then they'll dilute it down. And there are products available that are actually um, labeled for use on dogs that you can dilute it down. Uh, if you have a problem with that, just go and buy a good permethrin spray for dogs. Um, or I, if you want a company recommendation, I, re- I sell and I use um, the Vetchem brand, V-E-T-K-E-M. And their spray was called Ovitrol. And they, I think they changed the name of it now. It's just called uh, Vetchem fly bot and mosquito tick flea repellent or something like that mm-hmm. but it's um that that's a really good product it stinks a little bit when it goes on but once it's dry you don't smell it anymore and that's a real safe product to use on puppies um, that's another thing with permethrin you got to be careful with puppies uh, in fact i probably wouldn't use it on younger puppies i would probably wait till they're at least um probably four to five months old before using a kind of permethrin spray on a, a puppy but with this spray, it doesn't have a straight permethrin. It's actually pyrethrin combined with some other stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a safe product to use on kit, kit, kittens and puppies. And and then, you know, use yeah. something on yourself, too. That's another discussion on... I was going to go into that, Doc. You, myself. you know, not, that's not my field to be talking about this kind right. of stuff. But when it comes to me being in the woods, it is my field because <laughs> I, I want to protect myself, too. And I just use, you know, the permethrin spray right on my chaps and uh, like a deep, deep product on my skin. I don't put permethrin on my skin, but you can spray your clothes down or you can buy clothes that are impregnated with permethrin. You can actually buy the clothes and they're good for like 70 washings. You can wash right. them and dry them and they still have permethrin in them. So uh, you can put the clothes on a clothesline and spray them down with permethrin spray and then just let them dry. Um, and there are sprays out there that are designed for that now too. So Yeah, I don't go in the woods anymore. Idea, though. You know, in our work, yeah. in our work, we were spending a lot of time in the woods and it seems like ticks just explode in the spring. And we found places where you could ship your uniforms off to have them treated for, you know, compared to yeah. a, a doctor's bill that goes along with Lyme's disease. It was cheap and it, it lasted up to 70 washings. Hey, I, I, I want to transition in if you're if you're comfortable there with preventative doc, I'd like to transition into the super hot topic of thyroid disorder. Um, okay. Thyroid, you see that? I mean, anytime anybody says, hey, I got a problem with my dog, the first thing that pops up in a response is go get him checked for thyroid. So, um, you know, how, how common is thyroid disorder and and what is the systemic, pro- uh, you know, what is the problem there? What's causing this stuff? Yeah, you know, I never heard of hypothyroidism in um, in coonhounds until, you know, probably about 12, 15 years ago. Uh, I actually had a client come in with a dog that was having some breeding issues and uh, weight problems on her dog, and we diagnosed it with um, hypothyroidism. And it really shocked me because I have never seen coonhounds with hypothyroidism before. And just in the last five years, we've just seen this huge surge of um, information coming on the message boards about you know, my dog's got thyroid, he's on thyroid medication. So it, it's about the same time we started seeing this huge surge in tick-borne illness also. And I, I kind of wondered, you know, how much of this is actually due to a condition called um, euthyroid 6 syndrome. Uh, again, that's called euthyroid 6 syndrome. It's ESF. And that's where a dog has a disease process going on in its body and it's affecting thyroid hormone production. Or Mm -hmm. are these dogs actually true true primary hypothyroid cases? Are they actually suffering from thyroiditis, which is actually an autoimmune disorder, a hereditary condition in dogs, where the thyroid gland is actually being destroyed um, by its own immune system? Right. And a couple of interesting things on um, on hypothyroidism with thyroiditis, uh, which is the autoimmune destruction of their own thyroid gland, the hereditary one. That can take a couple of years for that to happen. So. If a dog's like a year or two years old and it's starting to already destroy its own thyroid gland, it can take two to three years before it actually shows up clinically uh, for that dog to show signs of it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, it takes uh, 75 to 80 percent of the gland has to be gone before they start showing signs of hypothyroidism. So real similar to what we see with kidney disease, where kidney disease, 80 percent of the 75 percent of the kidney uh, structure has to be destroyed or the function has to be destroyed before you're going to start seeing signs of kidney disease. Uh, same thing with the thyroid gland. About 75 to 80% of the gland has to be gone, wiped out completely before you start seeing signs of thyroid issues in dogs. And th- what doesn't uh, jive with me in some of these uh, coonhounds that are being diagnosed 
couple of them. One, they go to their veterinarian and they're getting a in-house thyroid panel done. Our thyroid, not a panel, but a thyroid test done. Yeah. And basically they just test thyroid. They don't do anything else. They don't even do run a blood test on the dog as far as chemistry panels and CBCs go. Um, so you, if there's one thing I want people to take home with uh, thyroid issues is that you can't diagnose hypothyroidism, primary hypothyroidism. You cannot diagnose that with one test. Okay. So you can't just go to your vet and have a T4 done and diagnose thyroid issues unless they did a cholesterol with that. So a cholesterol test with that and the cholesterol was elevated and the dog is showing clinical signs of hypothyroidism, which is uh, obesity, uh, hair loss or dry, dull hair coat, uh, chronic ear problems or chronic ear infections, uh, urinary tract issues like urinary tract infections, Mm -hmm. um, weight gain, weight gain, heat seeking, because these dogs, um, thyroid hormone regulates metabolic, um, you know, metabolic turnover, cell turnover. So it affects the metabolic rate. And so these dogs are sometimes cold and they, they're constantly seeking heat. Um, so the, the clinical signs have to match what they're being diagnosed with, or it just, to me, it doesn't hold true. And, and most of the internal medicine specialists are going to say the same thing. So I think that a lot of these dogs that are being diagnosed with thyroid issues are actually euthyroid 6 syndrome dogs that actually have some other disease process going on, like a tick-borne illness. So I tell these guys on the board, I say, hey, guys, go get your dogs tested for tick-borne illness first before you start these dogs on thyroid medication. Because here's the other big thing that comes along. These guys are putting their dogs on thyroid medication that is going to suppress the production of their own internal thyroid uh, hormone production and shrink that thyroid gland even more. And it can have long-term <laughs> effects on the dog. Yeah. So if they're starting these dogs on thyroid medication and they're, they've got tick-borne illness or something else going on that's mm-hmm. causing that, it's not true hypothyroidism. Now they're, they're creating a, a, a more damaging effect on the thyroid gland than they previously were. Wow. You know, and, and that's similar to uh, medicine for people as well. My son has hypothyroidism, and he's, he's kind of a freak because he's, he, I mean, his body fat's only like 3%. But um, mm-hmm. we had to have some extensive screening done to get to the bottom of that, whereas you just go into a general practitioner and, and uh, they do your standard, oh, thyroids, oh, I don't see anything. It's like, eh, something else is going on here, and they had to run a more extensive screening to catch that. So yeah. transferable to humans as well. Yeah, I think there needs to be more of a, a broad education to our own profession too because a lot of uh, old-time school veterinarians don't understand um, – what it takes to actually diagnose primary hypothyroidism instead of um, just doing their own in-house testing. And I would recommend that any dog, you know, that you want to have tested for thyroid issues, send the, send the blood panel out to a a reference laboratory instead for accuracy and have um, what's called a free T4 by equilibrium dialysis or ED. So a free T4 by ED combined with a thyroid stimulating hormone uh, assay or TSH. And those two things are almost 100% accurate. If you do those two together, they'll actually rule out that this dog doesn't have some underlying issue or disease process going on that's causing that um, hypothyroidism in that dog. Steve? So any of those diseases, heart disease. Uh, Steve, you Steve, you've you, been pushed over. No, no. <laughs> We're oh, train wrecking here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, St- buddy. Anybody Steve, go ahead. hurting this wreck? <laughs> <laughs> Doc, um, I, I recently okay. spoke to a breeder that uh, said that he had uh, chosen a particular stud dog that he that interests him, and uh, he wanted to breed uh, to the dog, uh, but then learned that the dog had thyroid issues. Is, is mm-hmm. this something that we that is genetic and and something? Uh, as breeders, we should be concerned about? Well, I, I think that, uh, especially the Walker breed, because there's so many Walker dogs. I, look, back when I first started, my friend told me there's 10 times more Walker dogs than all the other breeds put together kind of thing. So we're probably seeing more hypothyroidism in Walker dogs because there are just more Walker dogs out there. Mm-hmm. But there could be a line, uh, certainly a hereditary line issue going on there. I would recommend to the Walker breed right now, anybody who's got a major stud dog out there, get those dogs properly tested, you know, get it tested for uh, both the free T4 by ED I just talked about and the thyroid stimulating hormone, get a cholesterol done, 
look at the signs this dog's showing. Is it showing signs of, of bilateral hair loss, so hair loss on both sides of the body, uh, dry, dull skin coat, obesity issues? Does it jive with hyper, hypothyroidism? Because I think a lot of the, the diagnosis in the Walker breed is wrong. I do think there's a lot of dogs out there that don't have true hypothyroidism. So until we know that, Steve, I really can't recommend that they breed to those dogs because the dog could just have a secondary infection going on that's causing low thyroid in that in that body, and um, and it's not hereditary. So, if it's if it's definitely been diagnosed as a primary thyroid problem and it's been done correctly, and we know for sure that the dog's hypothyroid, primary hypothyroid, then I would say yeah, definitely don't be breeding that dog. Get get them out of the gene pool. Understood. Understood. Thanks. Yeah. Doc, we yeah. kind of we kind of had a train wreck there, and you had a thought going, and and we kind of derailed you there a little bit. Uh, what did you do? You remember what you wanted to say there before we all jumped on each other? Oh uh, no, the, the biggest thing was that uh, I think that people are misled when it comes to testing for thyroid issues in dogs and thinking that you know just because my dog's been slick tree and more or it's got some performance issues that it's thyroid related. But I think that we need to be looking uh, more broad scale at what, what could be causing this thyroid issue other than, you know, true hypothyroidism, primary hypothyroidism. And there are other diseases that can cause the suppression or decrease of thyroid production in dogs. So we've got to be ruling out these other, these other things, too, and doing proper, uh, doing proper thyroid testing, okay? So what we're going to see in a dog that's true hypothyroid is, you're going to see a decrease in the free T4 by equilibrium dialysis. And the reason I say equilibrium dialysis, because there's other tests out there like RIA, which I'm not going to get into what the differences are, but just remember equilibrium dialysis is the most accurate assessment of thyroid. And explain that, Doc. Explain that in layman's terms for us a little bit. Yeah, so what it's going to do is going to differentiate your, when it comes to like the thyroid um, hormone, there's bound and there's unbound. And this just measures the unbound, which is the usable thyroid in the, in the body. Um, so it's actually measuring actual thyroid hormone that's in the body that's usable to that dog, okay? So it gets rid of the, the bound stuff, and it only measures the, the unbound thyroid. And that's the useful thyroid. That's what we really want to measure. Mm-hmm. And what that'll do is it differentiates between dogs that have a disease going on that's suppressing the thyroid um, hormone level, like a heart disease or a liver disease or a tick-borne illness, um, those kind of things that can suppress thyroid hormone production because they're sick, it'll differentiate those dogs from a dog that has true hypothyroidism, which is from atrophy or destruction of the thyroid gland, which is, we talked about the hereditary component of that. It's called thyroiditis, um, and that's the hereditary one. So it's going to differentiate between those two. And the other test, which is going to make it 100% accurate, is doing a thyroid stimulating hormone test because if the thyroid levels are truly suppressed in a dog, then your thyroid stimulating hormone that's coming from the brain telling your thyroid to produce more thyroid hormone, that should be elevated because it's saying, oh, my body's low on thyroid. I need to produce more thyroid hormone. The brain starts to, to produce more TSH to stimulate that thyroid gland. So your TSH level should be elevated and your, your total T4 and your uh, free T4 should be decreased in a dog with true primary hypothyroidism does Hmm. that make sense to you guys it does but tell me exactly what what the thyroid Hmm. does for that dog yeah so the thyroid is so important because thyroid hormone regulates um, metabolic rate in a dog It, it, it regulates cell turnover so the the reason that the skin is such a um telltale sign for thyroid issues because the skin is the largest organ in the body it's the one that is most visible to us and it's the largest and so we see dogs that come in here in our hospital that are have this dry, dull skin coat, you know, flaky. Um, they have hair loss, usually around the base of the tail or down both sides of the body, um, around the head area or neck area. You sometimes you'll see some hair loss. And sometimes we'll take these dogs to surgery. We, we, we clip their hair, and the hair doesn't grow back for months or it doesn't grow back at all. That's, mm, that's all interesting. Of thyroid. Yeah, and it affects uh, these, these breeding females, too, which... I don't want to get into the dog food yet, but um, it affects these breeding females too because hypothyroid is one of the leading causes of infertility in females and female dogs and probably male dogs too, even though we don't um, you know, have a, 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 a big broad base uh, that confirms you know, effects on sperm count and stuff like that. But it definitely affects sperm count. It definitely affects um, the vitality of a, a male dog too. 
but definitely number one, I would say the number one cause of uh, infertility issues in female dogs is um, thyroid issues that we see. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. That clears the air yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. to to sum it up, you know, to to bring it down to to my level that I can understand it, you know, there's certain things that I need to look for before I, I start running off to, to get a dog tested for thyroidism. So I'll just kind of sum that up. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Doc, but you said that I should be seeing some clear signs of hair loss, maybe some uh, unexplainable weight gain. Uh, uh, what else did you say? Yeah, so uh, chronic ear problems. These dogs have um, ear issues. They can have a lot of wax buildup in their ears or okay. chronic infections. Yeah. Yeah. Urinary tract issues. So urinary tract infections, Mm -hmm. um, they become heat seekers or they become cold intolerant and, um, dull, depressed, lethargic type attitudes. Sure. One of the worst cases I ever saw and one of the most common breeds affected by hypothyroidism is golden retrievers. And this is such a, uh, uh, such an extensive case or such a exaggerated case that it was like, it just shouted out to me as soon as it walked in the door, but these dogs actually develop facial, um, muscle problems they actually get a facial like a tragic uh, facial expression hmm. because it affects their muscles of their face and um, this dog came in with this tragic expression had the the dry dull hair coat a little bit thinning and going on in the hair coat but what was really interesting about this dog it actually presented because it was collapsing and so i took an x-ray and the dog had an enlarged heart and i've never seen that before with hypothyroidism and i started reading about it and sure enough you know it definitely can lead to um low heart rate and this dog had a heart rate around 35 or 40 uh which is we call it bradycardia which is low heart rate mm-hmm. in dogs and um in this huge voluminous heart so we put the dog on thyroid medication and it took a couple months <clears throat> but this dog turned around and was a new dog again and the heart size went down and that was a real extreme case of hypothyroidism but that's the most one of the most common breeds we deal with uh, is golden retrievers gordon setters yeah, uh, Dover, Dobermans are probably number two or three on the list too for hypothyroid issues. Hmm. Doc, I'd like to jump in there real quick. Are there certain? Uh, have you been able to ascertain whether certain breeds of coonhounds ha- are more apt to have a particular disease or condition than others? I mean, are there kind of breed specific issues here that? That uh, among our our I know that our hounds are primarily separated by color genetically. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I just wondered if, you, in your experience, you have have seen anything particular that that's uh, you know to be expected in a given breed. Yeah, I think that there <laughs> there are certainly a couple of things that I've noticed um, in certain breeds through the years. Um, certainly a big one is hip dysplasia. And, um, and I think it affects every breed that we, especially large breed dogs and giant breed dogs. You got to be concerned in almost every breed with hip dysplasia, but there I've seen, um, my fair share of hip dysplasia in red bone coon hounds. That's for sure. And then if you look at a lot of the breeding going on, the red bones, there, there's some tremendous amount of, um, inbreeding going on and real heavy line breeding going on. <clears throat> Just to give you an example, I have a female right now. Her name is Cat Scratch Fever. She's a Grand Knight champion and a PKC. I think she's just a regular champion in PKC, but super good dog. But her breeding, um, she goes back to a dog named Moonlight Kate, who was uh, one of the Purina Awards. And Moonlight Kate um, has Timber Chopper in her 22 times. Mm. I mean, that's just absurd. This dog, Cat, has Moonlight Kate in her three times, making that she's got Timber Chopper 66 times just through that one female. So if there's any genetic problems going on through timber chopper line, that's going to show up in that in in, in these in these dogs today. Uh, so I'm really concerned about that because I do I do like the concentrated breeding at the same, same time. And Max Hunter has always been the uh, the founder of the timber chopper line. He's always been real big on line breeding, and I have been too. But that's one of the things we have to be aware of. Any genetic thing that comes up is going to be amplified through that really concentrated breeding like that. Um, so yeah, I've seen through the years, I've definitely seen hip dysplasia and red bone coon hounds. And that's, um, one of the things we deal with, uh, having to look forward is making sure that these dogs aren't, that's not being passed through. Uh, and I don't know what line it's coming from because I remember I bred a female who was a woodpecker female to a dog in Texas at the time in the, in the late seventies. And there was, um, one or two puppies in that litter that had hip dysplasia. So this is not nothing new. This is way before, and those were not timber chopper bred dogs at all. So, um, yeah, I don't know where it's coming from or if it's a genetic 
issue in the, the red bone coon hunt specifically, but I just can tell you that from breeding red bones, we, that's something we've all, it's always been on the back of my mind. Now the blue tick coon hounds, um, definitely have some eye issues, um, just because of their skin, a lot of those, those, um, blue ticks has a lot of skin, uh, around their face, you know, and so you've got entropian issues, which is, um, where the eyelid actually dips into the eye and, mm -hmm. and then you have ectropian, uh, which is in every breed, almost every breed has issues with ectropian and that's where the eyelid, uh, actually droops out. So these dogs are running through cornfields and they're picking up all those seeds in their eyes and stuff like that. And ectropian and entropian are both uh, long-term hereditary issues in, in the hounds we have to be careful with. Um, ears, definitely, uh, I've seen more ear infections in blue tick coon hounds with longer, I think the longer ears, like the, the bloodhound style dog. Mm -hmm. um, the longer those ears and the more the covered up the ear canal is, it has less air that gets down in there. Uh, I think they're more prone to ear infections. And then, uh, and then we're starting to see, you know, food allergies in, in coon hounds too. So, and I can't say any breeds any more prone than the other. And now this hypothyroidism, we're definitely seeing, you know, there are actually some Walker, Walker dogs that have been taken to the university of Michigan, for example, which is a great school for thyroid issues. They're probably number one and, um, have been diagnosed with primary hypothyroidism. So we know that exists in at least the Walker breeds and, and I've diagnosed, you know, at least one in the red bone coon house. So we know it's in there. I don't know how prevalent it is in red bones and how prevalent it is in Walker breeds, but there's definitely Walker, um, some issues in the Walker breed with thyroid, with thyroid, primary thyroid, hypothyroidism. Yeah. Well, you touched on it a second so, ago, doc. You said you weren't ready mm -hmm. to go there yet, but, um, uh, you've talked about food allergies and I think that will take yeah. us right into uh, th the conversation that kind of lit your fire the other day when we were talking. So talk to us about canine diets. <laughs> yeah, it, that is a super hot topic. You know, and, yeah. <laughs> the first, first thing I want to say is I, I've fed probably 30 or 40 different diets as a coon hunter. <clears throat> from the time I was 14 years old till I was probably um, like 30 years old. <clears throat> so you got like what, 16 years there of, of 30 different diets I've tried. Uh -huh. I mean, you remember back then there was, everybody was coming out with a new diet for coon hounds, you know, right. sure. had joy yeah. out in flavor of the day. Huge. Yeah, it was big, you know, and we were always trying to find that performance diet that cost 10 to $15 a bag. <laughs> uh, for a 40 pound, 50 pound bag. Exactly. <clears throat> you know, we could feed our whole kennel with. And uh, I, when I first started coon hunting, I was actually feeding toughies, which you, you could find going down the road to a pig place, you know, because they were feeding toughies to pigs at $8 for a 50 pound bag, you know, or 60 mm -hmm. pound bag. And uh, I tried that in my dogs, you know, and it, these huge stools would come out and the hair coats just looked pr kind of rough, you know, but the dogs survived on it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I really started studying diets. And when I got into veterinary school, I learned a lot more about quality control. And that's what it really comes down to is that, you know, how many of these companies have veterinarians on board or uh, board certified nutritionists? You know, they don't have to be a veterinarian, but a nutritionist on board that's, that's actually a PhD or doctor of nutrition that knows what the heck they're doing. How many of those companies are actually doing research on their own diets, doing a feeding study, doing, you know, that actually have documentation on their diets how many of them have actually um you know done analysis on their foods uh, through afco standards and stuff like that that show that these diets actually meet the requirements of those dogs and and then the big thing today is that you know how many of these companies have actually studied the the toxicity effects of some of the additives and the these exotic food that they're feeding these dogs you know it's good for the human it's got to be good for the dog mentality kind of stuff well you tell us uh, you tell us yeah. doc you tell us how many are well, out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, there's three companies right now that I know of that do their own research and that are providing most of, of the data and the most most of the research for for dog foods. And back back when I was in school, it was Waltham it was huge. They were a worldwide uh, monster company that did a lot of the research on dog foods and kills, of course, back in the 1940s. Mark Morris Research Foundation. Uh, was developing a diet for kidney disease in dogs. And that's when the Hills Corporation stepped in and said, hey, we're, we're interested in this stuff. And they bought out their rights for the KD formula, kidney diet, 
that helped to um, allow dogs to live longer lives that were suffering from kidney disease uh, with lower phosphorus levels and higher quality protein. And that's the big two in that diet. And um, well, Hills got into that prescription diet line and he just took off. It was crazy how they just flourished with that. And then they developed science diet, of course, um, you know, based on a lot of their findings. And then you've got Purina, which is a, a, a monster company uh, in their own. And they've got what, three or four different lines of dog foods out there. So you can, you can get from their bottom line stuff of, um, I can't, I'm trying to think of what their bottom line food would be, but I don't even want to go there, but they, you know, all the way up right. to their pro plan lines and their, and their prescription lines. And I'll tell you, there's a, there's a big difference in quality between what they are coming out with in their lower end lines and what they come out with in their higher end lines, almost to the point where I think that there's, there's gotta be a difference in who's doing the studies on those foods and who's doing the feeding trials and stuff like that. Cause their higher end lines, the pro plan lines and their veterinary lines are some of the best I've ever seen. Um, and then Waltham was bought out by Royal Canaan. Royal Canaan is, um, is now the largest in the world for, um, as far as dog food manufacturers and research uh, that they provide on their foods. And, and they're doing continuous research every single day. They're coming out with stuff. They're pumping all kinds of information, uh, as far as, you know, what the effects of grain free diets are on dogs and, uh, difference of different proteins effects on the, on the, on the, on, on dogs as far as um, allergies and things like that. So they're, they're a big one. And then Eukanuba, uh, IM's Eukanuba, they were really big in the seventies. Uh, I always thought Eukanuba back in the 1980s was probably the best food on the market as far as um, feeding my performance dogs. And I saw a huge difference when I put my dogs on Eukanuba diet from any other food I was feeding back then. And it was like a night and day difference. And mm. um, I don't know if you can get that quality today that they actually made back then. They've been through a lot of uh, recalls and stuff like that, but they're huge. Uh, Eukanuba and IM still pump out a lot of research. But now what's happened is Mars Corporation bought out Eukanuba, IM, Neutro, which is California Natural, Evo, all those diets. Now they bought out Royal Canaan, which was the largest in the world. So they're, they're just a huge conglomerate now, Mars Corporation um, is just huge uh, in their profession. They're buying out veterinary clinics. They're buying out laboratories. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, um, they're kind of cornering the market to get on everything out there. So that's where that's changed. Um, so when it comes to feeding foods, if, if these companies aren't providing any research, if they're not showing us the benefits of putting rosemary in their diets or their, the benefits of, of some of these additives like peas and lentils and stuff like that and potatoes, you know, what's the effects long-term on those dogs, then um, I'd be really weary of feeding my dog anything from those companies. And then looking at any recalls that they've had in the past, I'll give you an uh, example. Uh, Diamond Dog Food Manufacturing is one of the largest manufacturer of dog mm-hmm. foods in the United States. Uh, and they provide, like, um, Costco's dog foods. Uh, they manufacture Costco dog foods. They manufacture a lot of foods for other companies that you wouldn't even know. Um, like, they... Um, they're an outsourced company for a lot of companies uh, that don't do their own dog food that actually are a marketing company. And then they use diamond dog food for making their foods for them. Um, and if you go back and just do, you know, a search for recalls, diamond dog food company, they, they've been through their share. <laughs> they've been through a lot of ups and downs and stuff. And it only takes one recall, one bad thing to happen to wipe out your dog, you know, right. as far as their health goes. Uh, Doc, can I jump bite- in here? Can I jump in just a second here? Uh, Very interesting stuff. I know when I went to the UKC full time, I was a field rep for about three years. And in 1983, I went to work at UKC. And and that spring, we went out to the research farm in in Gray Summit, Missouri for uh, Purina to have the Purina Award. And and we were taken through and and, um, saw all... uh, didn't understand it, but saw the amount of effort and expense that they put into research. And then later yeah. on, as the editor of ProHound magazine and, and Coonhound Bloodlines magazines, I was invited to the sporting dog summits that Purina puts on and got to meet firsthand some of the uh, uh, PhDs, Ar- Arlie Reynolds up in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska comes to mind. He's a musher up there, but he's one of the people that works with them on on, uh, feeding for uh, nutrition and performance. So that's the only example that I have to share. 
but I do know that that one company does put a lot of effort into research, and I'm sure, uh, as you've said, these other large companies do. But it's pretty impressive to see uh, the lengths they go to to produce a good product. So let's let's yeah, kind of quality control. Yeah. Go ahead, Doc. Go ahead. Well, I just want to say that the quality control is, to me, more important than looking at the ingredient list on dog foods. And I know that the grains, especially corn, have taken a big hit in the last 10 to 15 years. And what we're finding today is that it was a big marketing move uh, for some of these companies to move into uh, this big premium dog food market. And that uh, we're going back to grains again. These dogs are suffering from uh, some of the key ingredients are key nutrients that are in grains um, that are keeping these dogs healthy. For example, uh, grain-free diets now have been tied into uh, a heart condition called dilated cardiomyopathy. In dogs, we've never even seen it before. Um, and that's an uh, FDA has already listed an alert in November for that. Um, has a, I've got it written down right here in front of me. If you, if you guys, we get time in the program, I'd like to just read a real quick synopsis of that because I think it's something that's really important we need to look at, um, being careful with um, feeding what they call beg diets, which is your boutique diets, your exotic diets, and your grain-free diets that go, can actually be detrimental to your dogs. Well, go for it, Doc. Yeah, so the U.S. Food and uh, Drug Administration uh, alerted pet owners and veterinary professionals in, um, this is actually from July of last year, but I know November is when we actually, as veterinarians, got the um, the notice that um, <clears throat> they were seeing an increase in um, dogs that normally we don't see these breeds developing dilated cardiomyopathy. It's a condition that creates a large voluminous balloon-style looking heart uh, on X-ray or ultrasound, and um, it, it can basically uh, it, it kills dogs long term. They, they just go into to heart failure basically. Um, and what they're doing is they, they've actually, the cardiologists, working with cardiologists and nutritionists and linking these to dogs that are fed grain-free diets. Now, that was the first one that came out. Now they're realizing it's more than grain-free. It's actually uh, diets that are, they call the beg diets, which is your boutique diets that it might be some celebrity that's supporting this food. And it's, um, it's got some crazy ingredient list that stuff that's never been studied in dogs. I was telling you, I was joking about the rosemary but that's actually found in some dog mm -hmm. foods right and rosemary we know and people have great benefits but in dogs you can't just extrapolate extrapolate human research and effects or results and put that into dogs because we know that there are things that dogs can't have like grapes for example those are toxic to dogs raisins chocolate mm. those right. are still dogs you know so these companies have never even studied these products and they're sticking them in dogs peas, lentils, leg, legume seeds, potatoes uh, as main ingredients in these diets, you know. And the FDA is working with um, the cardiologists and nutritionists. They're finding a link uh, between dogs that are showing up dilated cardiomyopathy and these diets that are on the market. And that's basically as far as they've gotten. At first, the cardiologists and nutritionists thought that they had honed it down to a taurine deficiency, and in, in the 1970s, 1980s in cats, we found out that cats that had um, large hearts, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a different disease, but similar effects long term, it's bad, um, was linked to a deficiency in taurine amino acid. And we found out that cats have a requirement for taurine amino acid. And I think in people, they're actually finding that taurine is very beneficial for heart disease too. But they thought they, they had it weaned down to this is what was causing this problem this time around, too, and it's not. They actually found that a lot of these dogs that are being diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy have uh, sufficient taurine levels. They're thinking that might actually be a toxicity effect from the legumes and lentils that are in these um, diets now, like peas and stuff like that. Wow. So really interesting stuff that's going on there. And just keep your ears open, and I think within the next one or two years, they'll, they'll probably get it figured out. Well, Doc. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, bring it. Talk to us about iodized salt. Is my dog not coming into heat <laughs> because of the salt right. that is in certain dog foods? Yeah. Well, they when they removed a lot of the grains from the, the foods, those are natural iodine sources, and they have to make up for those deficiencies by adding iodine back. And uh, potassium iodide is one of them. 
for example, it's a salt. And um, we don't know yet. We don't know the long-term effects of potassium iodide um, on the thyroid levels in dogs. We don't know effects on their cardiac effects even. So it's going to be interesting going forward because I know we'll get some answers here. There's definitely enough research being done on this to find out what's causing these issues in these dogs. You know, are these um, thyroid-related issues uh, that are come out in dogs, are these re reproductive issues we're seeing in dogs, you know, is it related to these iodine um, compounds or is it something else? You know, it could be something else that's in those diets that's uh, affecting these dogs too. So you can't just, uh, you know, do a small feeding trial. I see this one guy that had four females on this certain diet and then switched it to another formula and um, all of a sudden they started cycling again because there could be other environmental effects too there. Um, but it is kind of suspicious, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you start seeing more and more of those, uh, dogs being fed the same type of formula and they switch to another brand and all of a sudden they're seeing their, their dog cycling again. And all I can say is, you know, stick with name brand commercial dog foods. If you're having any issues with those female cycling and, you know, whether it's be Purina or Yukonub or a science diet, those three are my favorites actually to go to or Royal sure. Canin. Um, and I, th and I think you'll be fine, uh, seeing, if you start seeing those female cycle, then I'd be really suspicious that maybe you did have a, an issue with your past dog foods. Mm -hmm. Doc, we've come a long way from the days when my dad was a kid on the farm in middle Tennessee <laughs> and they fed the dogs cornbread, dog bread. You know, and, and, and the fall, yeah, they bake a big, mm -hmm. big cast iron skillet of dog bread Oh yeah, and they might yep. put some cracklings in there you know, yeah. to, to slick them up a little bit, you know, and yeah. those, uh, those foxhounds, my uncle's foxhounds and all would run all night on that, on that dog bread. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but they yeah, well, you could also read a newspaper through them the next day. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, I actually did quite a bit of bear hunting back in Wisconsin and I had friends that I would help out with, um, keeping their dogs healthy, bear hunting and those dogs, you know, after you go bear hunting for a week, you look at coon hunting totally different. Coon hunting is like a, a walk in the park. It, it's so easy compared to bear hunting where we went, anyways. Mm -hmm. um, it, even though you're even though you're driving a lot in in the in a pickup truck bear hunting, once you get going to the dogs, it's man, it's a zoo up there in northern Wisconsin where we were hunting. It, trying to get through some of that brush, and it would take us like four or five hours to get into those dogs sometimes and get out of there. It was just crazy. And I would I would lose like four or five pounds of weight myself, you know, just during the week. It's just that much walking. Yeah. And so when I came back to uh, my little hills of southern Wisconsin that I was complaining so much about, you know, having to climb, it just made it like a cakewalk compared to that. So these dogs that are bear hunting, they're they're pushed to the max. And within one to two weeks, most of those dogs have their lean body fat is just there's hardly any fat on them at all. And um, they really have to push, just like sled dogs, which I think you're having a nutritionist come on later to talk about, um, you know, probably ener energy issues that we deal with in dogs, mm -hmm. nutritional issues. These bear dogs, uh, they're just pushed to the max. And so what these guys were doing is just like the sled dogs, they're having to supplement with meat scraps. And it, it really made a huge difference. They would just go to the butcher and, you know, get these big bone broth and meat, meat scraps and just throw it to these dogs along with dog sure. food. Because there's no, there's no commercial dog food that I know of that, even your super 40% fat products, they can keep up with these dogs that are pushed that hard, you, like sled dogs and bear dogs. Yeah. So I got to see dogs pushed to the max, uh, you know, in that. And guys are traveling all the time with those dogs on the road. And we know how on our own bodies, that road's really hard on, on us as well as our dogs. It's just being in a dog box traveling eight, 10 hours, you know, all the time. And then having to perform, you know, you show up at a hunt four o'clock in the afternoon, you enter, you're the anxieties the dogs are going through in a different location and, and then having to hunt all night and these PKC hunts, man, I'll tell you, you go out and you hunt two hours in a early hunt and then you go, you qualify for a late hunt, you know, like a PKC pro hunt or something like that. And then you go to those late hunts and you're hunting those late hunts or even like a world hunt, you know, you got to qualify early and late to get into the semifinals. Those dogs, man, I'll tell you, they're pushed to the max. They are definitely uh, feeling it. And, uh, if they have any kind of disease process, like a tick-borne illness, anything underlying going on, it just makes that nutritional requirement so much higher. Uh, trying to get those dogs to eat even, because some of them get fussy when they get pushed hard too, you know. Mm -hmm. So I do think that supplementing, you know, he'll probably, to that nutrition might talk a little bit too. But we've always supplemented with like um, ground hamburger 
just raw hamburger, just feeding um, like a real cheap hamburger, which has a high fat content, adding those kind of things to the food to get these dogs to eat more food. And those dogs, they do have, they get pushed pretty hard. Most of our dogs get pushed hard enough to where they need supplements on top of dog food. Like Steve was saying, you know, you got to cook for them. You got to, you got to supplement stuff to them. Yeah. My dad for years, he, uh, for over 50 years, he hunted bears with hounds in them in the Eastern mountains and uh, fed the best dog food that he could find. But he always supplemented with meat scraps that you mentioned, especially in the winter months. Uh, the old mountaineers would say, well, the dog's not in shape until you can hang a ring on their hip bones, you know, but, Mm -hmm. um, my dad liked to see him nice and slick and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, but, um, uh, are we through talking about dog food yet, Chris? I, I think we've shined that tree enough, Steve. <laughs> I, I wonder from the performance, this is the Houndsman XP, uh, podcast from a, as we talk about bear dogs and performance dogs, uh, one of the hardest things to keep a dog ready for the hunt day after day after day is keep their feet in shape. Uh, yeah. uh, Doc, do you have any tips or any any thoughts about how houndsmen can uh, can uh, are there topicals that they can put on? Are there things that can be done to toughen the dog's feet? Uh, I know nothing takes the place of of you know roading the dogs and actually working the dogs, but that was always a problem uh, in especially in rocky ground. I went out to. Uh, New Mexico to hunt. I took a plot female uh, out of Michigan, and um, I took her out there, and and she got on a bear. And when I picked her up, first of all, she looked like a prickly. I uh, looked like a pin cushion with all the prickly pear uh, s- sticking in her. But she also was trying to lift all four feet off the ground at the same time because she was so f- sore footed. So I just wondered if you had thoughts on that. Yeah, we deal with a lot of that out here, too. The hunting in uh, California is pretty intense as far as the terrain. And that's one of the reasons I don't hunt out here is just, just the, the shale rock is just eats up the dog's feet. And the brush out here is just so thick and the mountains are so jagged and um, irregular and, and steep. <laughs> I don't know if I'd survive climbing these out here anyway, but <laughs> we see a lot of these right. dogs that come in and their their pads are all eaten up and stuff like that. And, you know, the thing is... Um, these dogs have to be conditioned. First of all, we have, when we were hunting bear back in Wisconsin, these dogs would show up. Um, people would bring them out there and they were fat out of shape. They were, you know, living out of the house kind of thing. And we see that with coon hounds now too. A lot of the coon hounds are living in the house and stuff and nothing wrong with that. I think it's a great thing. It's a good style of living and for these dogs. And, uh, but the problem is when it comes to conditioning their feet, um, and conditioning their bodies, you know, some of these guys think they can just show up at a, at a hunt, you know, once a week and not have to hunt the dog at all and keep them conditioned. So I think that the hunting itself is going to create a callus formation on those feet. Um, the way that they're um, outside, you know, if they're outside in the kennel situation, uh, cement, we certainly know creates a callus formation on the feet and helps with that. Um, I'm not a huge fan of cement because um, I think it's great for preventing disease and stuff like that and keeping them clean. I wish there was an alternative product if everybody could afford to have some kind of gym mat down. But, you know, that's not (laughs) very – what I did is I actually used uh, cow mats in my kennels, and those dogs would stand on the cow mats, those real heavy cow mats. And they were so cheap back then. They were like 50, 60 bucks a piece for those big heavy things, and they were like five, four or five feet wide and six, seven feet long. And that was great for dogs to stand on, stuff like that. But there are some things you can do. Um, Lanolin-based products like bag balm really works for conditioning the skin. Hmm. And then uh, there's that, like, you know, tough coat type products. You've heard of those tough pads sure, uh, sure. products. What those do is they, they create a mild irritation of the skin and, and the callus formation for those dogs um, long term. And they, and they do help. They definitely help um, condition the, the pads of the feet. But, yeah, it's something we have to deal with all the time. But I think if people would just clean those feet when they're done uh, hunting – just clean those feet up really good and get the mud and the dirt out of there. So if there is any um, cracks or uh, any lacerations going on in there, at least they're cleaned up and they'll heal uh, better, quicker. And then using uh, lanolin-based products like bag balm, things like that, really help with conditioning the skin too. It's a tough one. And uh, we have people that have tried boots. And these boots don't stay on these dogs. You know, like right. hunting in North Dakota in the middle of the winter. It's yeah. 20 below zero and their feet are freezing up. 
it's it's yeah it's challenging yeah i've uh, coyote hunted in michigan and see the ice balls that would be l- as large as marbles between the dog's toes and all yeah. that <laughs> pretty extreme yeah i i got invited to go to north dakota pheasant hunting on my birthday december 12th and it was 22 below zero the opening morning and uh, I just said to my buddy, I says, the pheasant even come out in this cold weather, you know. <laughs> no more, no more, no more. And I said that. You know how it goes when you say something like that. No yeah. more. And we said that. And here's a pheasant walking across the railroad tracks. I'm like, that is crazy. I can't believe they're out <laughs> in that kind of cold weather. Right. And, uh, yeah. These dogs were get. Yeah, these dogs, their feet were getting uh, just frost burnt because it was so cold. And um, and then the male dogs, their scrotums were, you know, their nuts sacks were basically getting. Uh, freezer burn. Or no, exactly. Burnt, you know, I know. Uh, a, mine, mine, really? mine would be inside my merino long johns on days like that. <laughs> 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 hey, I know a, a a famous bear dog back in West Virginia, a dog called Santana, that belonged to. What my dad always said, the best bear hunter he ever met, a guy named John mm. Harris, and uh, okay, I know and, that and name. Santana. Uh, did get frostbite on his uh, testicles and uh, was yeah. uh, sterile as a result mm. in later Man. years. You know, so I could have saved some money. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think on those kind of days, you're better off just staying at home and you know watching your yeah, favorite football exactly. team or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, Doc. Yeah, um, Chris. Real- Go ahead. Before we leave, though, I want to. I just want to touch on one thing before we go, and that is um, Lyme disease, because we are seeing a surge of Lyme disease again. You know, back in the 1990s, when I uh, when I graduated, I was practicing on the Minnesota Wisconsin line, so I was right on the Mississippi River. We had over 100 cases of Lyme disease diagnosed that year, and when I graduated, there was a couple of professors that really thought Lyme disease was a farce, that it was um, mm-hmm. overdiagnosed, and that these dogs really weren't dealing with Lyme disease. Well, I got to see it firsthand. These dogs are coming in lame, 103 temperatures, testing positive for Lyme disease. Uh, they had all the symptoms, you know, like a achy arthralgia, um, flu-like syndrome symptoms, and um, and they responded to doxycycline when we put them on that. So I know that, it, that and the thing is, being in that kind of a situation, we had over 100 dogs diagnosed with Lyme disease. Get this. So most of those dogs, except for one dog, came from Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Isn't that crazy? So no dogs in Minnesota came down with Lyme disease. All of them were from Wisconsin. I know most and of the Lyme. Dog that was diagnosed. A lot of the information oh, we got on Lyme's disease, even in people, a lot of that information came out was developed in Wisconsin. That's where we got a lot of our information. Yeah. So the one dog that was diagnosed in Minnesota with Lyme disease uh, it was like 1992 in that range. Um, that dog was actually hunted in Wisconsin. Hmm. And what we found was that there was a lot of people in Buffalo County and Trumple County, Wisconsin, that were suffering from Lyme disease themselves, both the acute and the chronic uh, states of Lyme disease. And my ex-wife came down with Lyme disease. I had Lyme disease for a short uh, stint. I was on doxycycline. It cleared up. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, the classical uh, bullseye on the abdomen kind of thing, you know, the marks on the abdomen you see from the tick bite and, and the bacterial infection. So it definitely at that time became a true believer of that there's Lyme disease out there. Well, it wasn't that long after that, that Fort Dodge came out with the first Lyme vaccination. We vaccinated um, a couple hundred dogs in Wisconsin for Lyme back with a Lyme vaccine. And by the second year, it was just this major drop in um, Lyme disease. Hmm. Now it could have been that the, the, the deer tick or bear tick, the Ixodes tick, um, maybe the population dropped off, but I don't think so. I think, because I was hunting in Wisconsin at that time, I know that the, the tick population was still really high. But we definitely saw a dramatic reduction in the amount of Lyme uh, disease that we were actually seeing in dogs um, with the vaccination at that time. That was the first vaccine ever developed. So I always get a question of, you know, should I vaccinate my dog for Lyme vaccine or with Lyme vaccine? And um, my, question, my, my response is always, if you're in a, a Lyme endemic area where you know there's Lyme disease uh, and a lot of it, definitely have your dog vaccinated. There's no doubt about it. It definitely helps. It, it sure. definitely helps. The thing about Lyme disease is that um, dogs are way less prone to developing Lyme disease than people. So if 100 people were bit by a, an Ixodes tick and uh, was injected with the Borrelia bacteria, 
uh, most of those people would probably develop Lyme disease. Ninety percent of people would develop Lyme disease. That's a, that's hmm. the theory coming out here now, or the studies. And in dogs, it's ten percent. Wow, it's totally different, totally opposite. Hmm. Yeah, so dogs are more resistant to Lyme uh, disease than people are for sure, and cats almost non-existent. <clears throat> and um, in dogs, it's more to do with their immune response to the um, to the bacteria, the Borrelia bacteria. So. Even though they're testing positive for Lyme disease, doesn't mean they have Lyme disease. It just means that they have been exposed to the bacteria. Um, and so whether to treat or not is uh, questionable. I would definitely, if my dog tested positive, I would definitely treat it. I would treat it for a minimum of 30 days, probably 60 days with doxycycline. Mm-hmm. And um, if there's any question about a dog developing the chronic states, where they're having neurologic issues or anything like that, then I would work with a specialist because there's some new medications on the market that we can use to um, overcome the, the brain cysts that are developed from the Lyme um, or from the Borrelia bacteria. So just a real quick thing on Lyme disease there is uh, a prevention is number one, use your systemic products like your Semperica combined with a, a good repellent um, on the dogs. I, and I recommend a repellent every night you turn those dogs loose, just spray them down or use a rag to put the, the spray in on there and then vaccinate those dogs for Lyme disease. And um, if they test positive and you're in an endemic area of Lyme disease, definitely just go ahead and start treatment on them right away. Mm-hmm. Don't wait around. Is there, okay. are there so physical, are there physical characteristics of this tick that, that carries the Lyme uh, that differentiates it from other ticks? Yeah, they're, they're small. Um, the Ixodes ticks is a smaller type tick, less than three millimeters in size. And um, if you look up pictures, you know, you can Google Ixodes ticks. You can see the difference in the size. Can from, you spell um, that for ticks. me, Doc? How about, hey, how, 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 how about if we do this? I'm going to send you an email afterwards because I want to get some information on uh, uh, some of the technical terms, the uh, preventative and things like that. So, uh, we'll put that in our show notes, Steve, and that way yeah, he just has okay. to spell it once. Yeah, that sounds good. But I think the thing to remember yep. here is no tick's a good tick. Right. <laughs> right. Ticks are just bad. <laughs> right across. Right. It doesn't matter if they're spreading Lyme disease or Ehrlichia or other bacterial infections. Just ticks are bad. <laughs> right. Right. Well, Doc, you've definitely, uh, I'll tell you what, I've, I've been guilty myself of, of doing some homebrew veterinary and stuff and, and maybe cutting some corners where I don't need to be. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to make an appointment to the vet and, and, uh, make sure everything's vaccinated for limes and, and get my parvo boosters and things like that. So I appreciate (laughs) your time. I really do. This has been great. Yeah, it's great. One little parting shot. I think a lot of our our listeners out there get scared away from veterinary care because they go uh, maybe to an urban vet or whatever. They commonly in the hound community call them a poodle vet or something. And right away they get a long laundry list of tests, examinations and all. And, you know, do you let's do this, let's do this, let's do that. And it, it and it tends to frighten them away. And yeah. is there a way that we can get around that to, um, you know, sure, we need to know. It, it's not just about giving the dog uh, a tenth of a cc of Ivermec once a month. It's a, it's a lot more important than that. And we need to be using professional care on these dogs because – they yeah. mean a lot to us. I'm guilty of keeping my dogs indoors down here in Florida simply because I have to. They won't let me build a kennel in the community that I'm now living in. But, you know, is there a way or any words of encouragement that you could give our hound people out here as to how to, you know, best uh, uh, care for their dogs, pr- maybe on a limited budget? Yeah, I think that... Um you know, as far as working with a veterinarian, find find somebody that has maybe a little background in uh, with hunting dogs. They understand where we're coming from, and uh, somebody that has a good reputation, obviously. And then just communication is really key, Steve. With anything, it's just making sure that you let them know what you want uh, instead right. of them just railroading you with all the stuff they're recommending. Because our profession's under a lot of, pr- of pressure right now. It's corporate pressure. Uh, we're being taken over by corporate medicine and these all these hospitals in this area are being bought out by corporate uh, entities and just like the dog food industry is being 
you know, overpowered by corporations. So is our profession. And you're going to see more of that style of medicine coming down the road where they're going to recommend every vaccine that's ever been manufactured for these dogs. So get educated on what vaccines you want done in your dogs and what needs to be done and, and only, you know, request those vaccines, for example. Uh, so just be smart. But I think working with a, with a veterinarian that's got integrity and uh, it has background in, in hunting dogs, um, you know, performance dogs really does help. And then um, what was your other question, Steve, as far as you said, home care, as far as doing stuff yourself? Well, is that what you're talking well, about? If, if you want to address that, that's fine, uh, Doc. But I think you pretty well covered what I'm talking about there. I think it's all about the relationship, finding the right vet and establishing that relationship. And, and I, you yeah. know, being forthright as I am many times about things, I would, when presented with those long lists, I would say, well, let's start by doing this and this. And then, right. you know, a, and we'll let the other ride. So just say no, I guess, in some cases would be the right answer. But, um, but yeah, if, if you're not comfortable with the recommendation, definitely. And then the other thing is I have a lot of friends that have these high price dogs that have uh, illnesses that your general practitioner is probably not going to be able to figure out, you know, if it comes to reproductive issues or dermatology issues that are more advanced. You know, and if you're close to a university, get to the university. It used to be the university was the most expensive place to take your dog, and now it's actually middle of the road. They're mm. actually less expensive than a lot of these high-end practices are uh, charging. And at least you're getting a specialist that way. You're going to get a, derma- a board-certified dermatologist for a skin problem or a board-certified reproductive specialist for a reproductive problem. And they have more power as far as, you know, they have more capabilities when it comes to diagnostics, too. Exactly. I had uh, Michigan you know. State nearby when I lived in Michigan, used their services yeah. a couple of times with great results. You bet. Oh, yeah. They're, they're a tremendous hospital. They're really good there. Yeah. yeah and as far as your, um, you know, trying to save money kind of stuff, there, there are some ways you can save money. Like when I had my dogs, I used um, ivermectin, for example, instead of heart guard because um, my veterinarian worked with me on teaching me how to save some money, you know. And it is off-label use, so it is controversial whether we are supposed to be talking about this kind of stuff or not. But, you know, I do talk about it on the boards, and I've got all kinds of stuff listed on the UKC board as far as keeping your dog healthy and what doses to use for ivermectin uh, for deworming your dogs and uh, the permethrin concentrations. All that stuff is on the UKC board. I've had all that listed on there for a couple of years now. So if people can find that information there, that would be, yeah. you know, I think beneficial. Well, Doc, for those who may not be familiar with that board, you can find that uh, message forum at uh, ukcdogs.com and uh, click on, uh, I believe, uh, message forums is is in the, the at the top of the page. Click on that and, and scroll down and find those topics. But uh, sure appreciate what you've done in the past for our uh, hound community doc and what you continue to do and it's been on uh from my standpoint it's been a terrific visit really glad that you came on today well thank you steve and chris i really appreciate being uh, you know invited to this show and it's uh one of my passions actually is to help people uh like the houndsman especially because that's my background um keeping their dogs healthier you know right letting them live their potential yeah we put so many demands on these hounds and and uh uh, it's just so refreshing to hear a houndsman, you know, talk open and honestly about, uh, about our hound care. So, and that's, that's the thing I've always admired about you, doc, when I read your responses is, is, uh, you know, you weren't throwing your, your professional ethics aside, but at the same time you were boiling it down to where a person could understand it and you didn't do it in a condescending way or, or anything like that. So, yeah, I, I, I think we're going to have to have you on again in the future and uh, uh, continue to have some of these conversations. So I know that sounds good to me. Yeah, I know you've got a uh, this is a work day for you. It's a a work day for me, too. So I'm going to have to roll out of here. But I appreciate you getting up this morning and and helping us out there, Steve. Uh, You always sign us off. So go for it. Chris, in the words of my old bear hunting buddy in West Virginia, you follow your hound and I'll follow mine.